Hello and welcome to this video on anti-glaucoma therapy. In this video, I'm going to talk about the various drugs, their mode of action, their adverse effects, how they're used in uh, glaucoma. And before I start that, I'm going to talk just a little bit about glaucoma in case just to give you a sort of revision on for those people who haven't studied this topic before, just to give you an overview. So glaucoma is an optic neuropathy, something wrong with the optic nerve. It's the pathology of the optic nerve. It's characterized by the progressive loss of retinal ganglion cell exons. Seems very complicated. So basically, the retina is organized in various layers, plexiforms layers, limiting membrane, and there is a lot of stuff. And one of one of the one of the most uh, inner membranes, one of the ones that's located very close to the uh, inner layer of your retina is the retinal ganglion cell. Retinal ganglion cells are the cells which give off the exons, the, the exons that form the nerve fiber layer, the exons that form the nerve. The retinal ganglion cell exons are responsible for the formation of the optic nerve so if there's the loss of retinal ganglion cell exons you're basically destroying the nerve that's the pathology with the optic nerve that's glaucoma okay so let us now look at a very very simplistic explanation of what exactly goes wrong in glaucoma so this is your eye this structure that you see entering from the back is the optic nerve what happens in this optic nerve is that this optic nerve enters at an area which is known as the optic disc and then it it goes around the eye forming the nerve fiber layer so basically what happens is from the there are cells which are located inside this layer which are known as the retinal ganglion cells these retinal ganglion cells, their exons form the optic disc and this optic, oh, sorry, the exons form the nerve fiber layer. This nerve fiber layer goes into the optic disc and then forms the optic nerve. Let's look at it in a bit more detail. So this is the optic disc. This is the optic cup. You'll hear about this cup a lot in ophthalmology. Cup is nothing but a central depression which is located into the optic in the optic disc that's all it's just that the rim is the thing of importance the rim is so if you if i ask you where are all the fibers crossing you'll see that in a bit all of the fibers are passing through the rim both the cup and the rim together form the optic disc now you see this these shiny fibers that you see here are actually the nerve fibers. The nerve fibers are not passing through the cup. The cup is not the important thing here. The rim is the important thing here. The rim contains all of these optic nerve fibers. This happens in glaucoma. The cup widens, the central depression, it deepens, giving you less optic nerve fibers less optic nerve fibers mean less transmission of visual information to your brain meaning meaning there will be gaps in your vision that that's what becomes concerning this is the retina so here just to give you a bit of detail the optic the, the optic cup widens the rim so the cup to disc ratio if i ask or the cup to uh, rim ratio if i ask that increases that increases so the the cup has been increasing in size this becomes concerning in glaucoma this is a normal optic disc this is a glaucomatous optic disc so if this was the cup in this picture sorry that was very okay so if this was the cup in this picture and all of this was the rim in this picture, where is the rim? It's just a tiny part located here. And all of this is the cup. The cup is widening in glaucoma. What are the risk factors for glaucoma? Age is a very important risk factor. So the incidence of glaucoma in ages under than 55, 
is very very low and it increases at 65 and it peaks at 80. Race is important. It has been seen to be more common in black people than in, uh, other population. It is seen to be more common in Hispanic people than other population, than non-Hispanic people. It is seen to be uh, more common uh, in black people than white people in comparison. Family history is a very important factor. It has been seen that the incidence of glaucoma is about 3.7 in people with a, uh, in, with a positive glaucomatous history in a sibling and about 2.2 times in those with a parent positive for glaucoma. So they're at almost twice the risk. And if you have a sibling positive for glaucoma, you're uh, at almost four times the risk. Elevated intraocular pressure. Now many people associate Many people think that elevated intraocular pressure is glaucoma. No, elevated intraocular pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma. Glaucoma, glaucoma in which the optic, uh, in which the optic nerve fiber layer is thinning, in which the rim of the optic disc is thinning, that is glaucoma. Elevated IOP is not glaucoma. Elevated IOP can be a cause, can be a risk factor for glaucoma. About 40% of people suffer from a type of glaucoma known as low tension or normal tension glaucoma. So elevated IOP, remember this, is a risk factor for glaucoma. Yes, so let us talk about elevated IOP. Elevated IOP does not mean glaucoma. As I said, elevated intraocular pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma. It does not mean glaucoma. Glaucoma is an optic neuropathy. If there's elevated IOP without that optic neuropathy, we just call it ocular hypertension. We don't call it glaucoma. As I said, in about 40% of people, there'll be normal, normal pressure or low tension glaucoma. So this is, the, uh, this is an example of an eyeball. This is a very simplistic diagram that I've made. That's the ciliary body. What does the ciliary body do? The ciliary body contains the ciliary muscles as well as those uh, non-pigmented, that epithelium that makes aqueous humor. The epithelium that makes aqueous humor. So it's produced in the ciliary body. It's, uh, so now showing the arrow is where the drainage of the aqueous humor. What is aqueous humor? Aqueous humor is that, uh, that amount of uh, aqueous material which is present between the cornea and your lens, which is your anterior segment. And it drains into two pathways. The trabecular meshware, which is responsible for the drainage of 90% of this aqueous humor, and the uveoscleral pathway, which is responsible for drainage of the rest of the 10%. What do medicines do? Now, the thing with glaucoma is that even though it's an optic neuropathy, the only thing that we can treat in patients is the raised pressures. We can treat the raised pressures. We try to decrease those pressures to help with glaucoma. That's the only thing. So if the pressures are raised, we try to decrease those pressures. Sorry. We try to decrease those pressures to help with, uh, to decrease the progression of this disease. That's the only thing we can do at the moment. What do medicines do? Medicines act how to decrease pressure. Obviously, how can they decrease pressure? They can either decrease the pressure by decreasing the production at the ciliary epithelium or they can increase the drainage, right? So they can act on the ciliary body or they can act on either, either of these two pathways. That's what they do. They decrease the production or they increase the drainage. So medications are divided into two. I divided the medications into decreased production, which include the beta blockers and the diuretics. They act to decrease the production and increasing the drainage, which include the prostaglandins and the cholinomimetics. Then there are alpha blockers, which do both of these. So let's look at beta blockers. They decrease the humor production. How do they decrease the humor production? By acting on the ciliary epithelium. The ciliary epithelium was responsible for the generation of the aqueous humor. You're decreasing the generation of aqueous humor. You're decreasing the pressures. What are the contraindications? The beta-2 receptors present in your lungs are responsible for bronchodilation. You inhibit these receptors. 
you're going to be in a problem in what patients is this a, a big problem bronchoconstriction particularly in what patients is a big problem asthmatic patients reactive airway disease so it's a contraindication to use these in reactive airway disease in asthma examples include timolol betaxolol cartiolol but in, but, but a question might be that we are applying these drops into the eye uh, why are they affecting the lungs so you can have absorption of these uh, of these eye drops into the systemic circulation through the nasolacrimal uh, duct into the nose where there is a very rich blood supply or even in the eye itself you can have systemic absorption of these drops and a problem with reactive airway disease in asthmatic patients moving on to cholinomimetics what does cholinomimetics mean cholinomimetics means drug which mimic the action of acetylcholine what's the mode of action glaucoma they cause the contraction of the ciliary muscle okay contraction of the ciliary muscle how does that help it it does not say it act, acts on the ciliary epithelium it opens up the trabecular meshwork so if this is the iris and my thumbs my thumbs they denote the ciliary epithelium contraction of this causes something like this and the trabecular meshwork opens up so ciliary muscles i've highlighted here if this is the trabecular meshwork this is the trabecular meshwork so contraction of the ciliary muscle was the opening opening of the trabecular meshwork which increases the drainage because trabecular meshwork is responsible for 90% of the drainage of aqueous humor side effects include meiosis so the iris sphincter muscle also contains uh, cholinergic receptors uh, so if you give this drug you will have meiosis ciliary spasm spasm of the ciliary muscles due to sustained contraction sustained uh, use of cholinomimetics you have had that acetylcholine like action in the synaptic cleft for so long that your muscle is going into spasm direct agonists include direct mimetics include pilocarpine and carbocol these are structures which resemble acetylcholine in their in their basic chemistry and then we have indirect cholinomimetics which include the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors what do acetylcholinesterase do acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine as the name says so you inhibit that enzyme which breaks down this thing and now you have increased level of acetylcholinesterase diuretics what does diuretic do what do diuretics do examples include acetazolamide was it what is an acetazolamide it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor but why carbonic anhydrase i remember that that was present in kidney but why here interesting thing is that carbonic anhydrase is responsible for the generation of aqueous humor so if you inhibit carbonic anhydrase you have decreased humor production decrease humor production decrease pressures how do you decrease pressure you either decrease the production or you increase the drainage what do diuretics do they decrease the production they have no vision or pupillary abnormalities direct correlation but obviously they do have systemic side effects the systemic absorption of acetazolamide might have a lot of side effects one of the most common i'll state one for you is urolithiasis kidney stones they predispose you to the formation of kidney stones there's also peripheral neuropathy which is reported which has been reported with acetazolamide so systemic absorption might have adverse effects prostaglandins how do prostaglandins act so the prostaglandins increase the drainage prostaglandins increase the drainage through the uveoscleral pathway remember i told you about two pathways there was drainage into two pathways there was the trabecular meshwork pathway which is responsible for about 90% of the drainage and then there was the uveoscleral pathway which is responsible for about 10% of the drainage this acts on the uvo scleral pathway side effects include eyelash growth i've added an example here and pigmentation of the iris examples include bimetoprost and latanoprost alpha agonists what do alpha agonists do examples include epinephrine and brimonidine let's talk about each of these they increase the drainage 
So what do alpha agonists do? They increase the drainage. But if you remember that flowchart I made in the start, alpha agonists both decrease the production and increase the drainage. Let's look at it how. They increase the drainage through the uveoscleral pathway, just like the prostaglandins. They decrease the production by acting on the ciliary epithelium, just like beta blockers. What are the adverse effects? So uh, the decreasing of production by action of or action on the ciliary epithelium is with brimonide. What does epinephrine do? Epinephrine has a direct vasoconstricting effect on the ciliary epithelium. So vasoconstriction decreased humor production. So what are the adverse effects? Adverse effects include midriasis, alpha receptors which are present on the uh, iris sphincter cause midriasis. They cause the dilation. It's contraindicated in closed angle glaucoma. If you want me to make a video on closed angle glaucoma, I can make a video on that. Blurry vision, hyperuremia, which, is me which means uh, increased blood supply, here. presence of foreign body sensation, meaning that something might be present in the eye. Blurry vision might be due to midriasis, which is the pupillary dilation. What's, what's midriasis? Pupillary dilation. Hyperemia. Increase, blood, increase uh, blood supply here. Foreign body sensation, the sensation that something might be present in your eye. Ocular allergies, ocular pruritus. So it might be causing ocular allergies and pruritus. Finally, let's talk, let us talk about the summary of all of these anti-glaucoma medications. Let me remove the pen markings. Okay, so glaucoma is an optic neuropathy. It's the pathology of an optic of the optic nerve. Elevated intraocular pressure does not mean glaucoma. It's a risk factor for glaucoma. How do we treat glaucoma? We decrease the elevated intraocular pressure. We decrease the intraocular pressure by decreasing the production of aqueous humor or increasing the drainage of aqueous humor. How do we increase the drainage? Through either to the trabecular the trabecular meshwork pathway or the uveoscleral pathway. Beta blockers decrease the production by acting on the ciliary pigment epithelium. Cholinomimetics increase the drainage in the trabecular meshwork by acting directly on the ciliary muscle. They contract the ciliary muscle, they contract the ciliary muscle, the trabecular meshwork opens up and that's where the fluid drains. Cholinomimetics cause Contraction of the ciliary muscle, open up the trabecular meshwork. What's the contraindication for beta blockers? Yes, reactive airway disease, asthma, very good. Diuretics decrease production by acting on carbonic, by inhibiting carbonic anhydrase. Diuretics decrease production by acting on carbonic anhydrase. So that's three Ds for you to remember, that's a mnemonic. Prostaglandins increase drainage through which pathway? Through the uveoscleral pathway. Alpha agonists decrease the production and increase the drainage through the uveoscleral pathway. How do they decrease production? Epinephrine decreases production by direct vasoconstriction through A1 receptors or alpha 1 receptors. Primonidine decreases production by acting on the ciliary pigment epithelium. It's contraindicated in closed angle glaucoma. Why? Because it causes pupillary dilation or midriasis. Midriasis may cause pupillary block. If you want me to make a video on closed angle glaucoma, please write in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching this. If you want me to make more videos or if you want to see more, more of my videos, you can go to my channel, subscribe, press the bell icon. Thank you so much for watching.